There we go. There we go. Yeah. Hello, we're live. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the week three hangout of EDC MOOC. It's fantastic to, well, not see you all here, but we'll, no doubt we'll soon be hearing from you all on everybody on um, Twitter and the other forums. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Sean Bain, and I'm one of the um, teachers on EDC MOOC. I'm based here in the School of Education at the University of Edinburgh, um, and I'm chairing the MOOC this week. And I'll just let my colleagues introduce themselves again for those who haven't been to a hangout before. Um, Jeremy, do you want to kick off? Hi, my name's uh, Jeremy Knox. I'm a PhD student here at the School of Education at the University of Edinburgh and uh, my research is on MOOC, so I'm really interested in um, how this particular course is uh, coming together. Christine. Hello, I'm Christine Sinclair. I'm a lecturer in digital education here at the School of Education and uh, really enjoying being on the MOOC. Hamish. Uh, hi, uh, Hamish McLeod. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer here in education uh, and all the other things that other people said and um, <laughs> yeah, it's fun. <laughs> Jen. <laughs> yeah, I just had an, an idea, you guys. I think every week we should say something different about ourselves when we <laughs> give our introduction. So, um, um, hi, hmm. I'm Jen Roth, and um, <laughs> I this semester um, I'm teaching a course called Digital Futures for Learning um, on our Masters in Digital Education program, and it has been really, really interesting. And one of the most interesting things is that um, students are making open educational resources as one of their assignments. Um, Hamish and I are teaching this course together, and these were submitted earlier this week, and so we've got a whole set of really fantastic resources um, underway at the moment. Thanks, Jen. Sounds fantastic. Yeah, um, next, week, every, next week everybody has to tell something different. <laughs> um, okay. I met Jen's dog this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone did. <laughs> Every Friday should have a dog in it. Um, okay, well, it's been, it's been a, a, a really busy um, week on the MOOC and a really good week, I think. The, um, about another 800 new people have joined us on the MOOC and have enrolled. Um, so welcome to, to those people um, if they're watching. And we've had some fantastic discussions in the forums and on the blogs and we're also seeing some really amazing images coming through um, in the image competition. And so there's still time to take part in that, so please do, and please post your images in Flickr. And don't forget, I'm, I'm doing a bit of a reprise of my very classy PowerPoint from last week. Um, don't forget to use the EDC MOOC tag when you put your images into Flickr so that they can feed into the Flickr River um, page and then be up for prizes because we have prizes for this week. And I'm just going to show you what you could win. Hold on a minute. We're jealous. We're all jealous. <laughs> oh, sorry, just a sec. Okay, here we go. It'll be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <Yay. laughs> You could win this amazing bauble, um, so <laughs> the University of Edinburgh festive bauble. So, please do um, send send in your image. Um, that would be great. Okay. So before we um, continue, I just want to remind you that um, we'll be opening the assessment for the MOOC on Monday morning UK time. So please do look out for that, um, and also look out for Hamish's introduction. Um, let me just get rid of that bauble. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to be the one to tell you you were still a bubble. It won't go away. Um, <laughs> there, there we go. So, sorry, guys. Um, so, and also look out for Hamish's introductory video, which will explain a little bit more about the ethos uh, behind the design of the assessment and, and how to think about approaching it. Um, and take so you to at, another bit of Edinburgh University. Yeah, one of our favourite bits, I think, isn't it? Um, mm. Yes, I won't spoil the surprise. Watch the video and see. Um, so, before we continue, just want to say a, a very sincere thank you to the MSc in Digital Education students who are helping us out this evening by monitoring the comments coming through from you on YouTube and G Plus and Twitter and feeding them into us. So thank you, um, Kevin McLeod, Fiona Smith and Stephen Bazina. That's fantastic that you can do that for us. And I just want to say thank you again to our um, fantastic community TAs who have been doing such great work across all the core spaces. So thank you, Ari and Wayne and Assam and Andy and Maddie and Sandra, Chris and Angela. You do a great job. Um, on that, I'll hand over to, to Christine, who's going to, I think she's going to start by giving us a bit of an update on the crowdsourced captioning we've been doing um, over the previous Hangout. So, Christine, over to you. Yes, and thanks, Shan. And there is um, a link, uh, it's been tweeted, 
um, for this week's Hangout. If you And I think it should be open now if anybody wants to, but I, I don't suggest that you, you live caption it. I think that would be quite demanding, <laughs> but it should be open. I know people tried last week to do it. I'd like to start by thanking everyone who participated in last week's transcript. It's not quite finished, um, but, well, it wasn't when I looked earlier on today, but once it is, we can start doing some things with it. And the first, obviously, is to turn it into a file that can be used to subtitle the video, um, and that's important if people are going to look at it in the future and it's going to be truly accessible. But there's more than that we can use it for, and seeing it makes me realize that I want to annotate it, and in fact, Keir Thomas has already suggested that. He added a couple of comments. Um, he loved Shan's word participatoriness. And, and, he, and then he added a link to the screen share that Jen showed with the cartoon from the XKCD online web comment. Uh, and he wondered whether it was appropriate to do that. And I thought it was indeed, and I'm encouraging it. Um, and in fact, I went back to it today as I remembered that I'd wanted to link to my comment, I'd, I'd said, um, we have a duty to disturb our students intellectually. And I always misremember this quote. What the author Wiggins actually said was, we have a moral obligation to disturb students intellectually, which is actually stronger, I think. Hmm. So I went in today to put in the reference to that which meant I had to do a bit of transcription too, as nobody had transcribed that bit of, of our talk. And um, actually doing this, it shows the difference between synchronous and asynchronous uh, communication. Um, where we quote, some, synchronously we maybe quote somebody in, inaccurately because of what's on our mind and we, we're not quite remembering it mm -hmm. properly. And when we're asynchronous, we can check our sources more carefully. And I think both states are important online. Uh, synchronous means that communication's in real time, like we're doing here for some people. It's asynchronous if you're watching the broadcast <coughs> later on, um, the recording. But um, asynchronous means that communication happens at different times for the participants and it can be edited or composed more slowly, it can be more thoughtful. And there's a discussion thread about this, about synchronous and asynchronous communication and different people's preferences for one or the other. And you might have seen something in the Twitter feed about this as well because a lot of people have been talking about this. Now some people, Maha, Bali, uh, Linda Kropp and Bard Meyer are going to do a survey in relation to this. So watch out for links to this if you want to join in. So think about whether you're more drawn to the immediacy of the synchronous encounters or to the more considered nature of the asynchronous. Um, you'll probably see them tweeting about this before too long. Now your answer to this might relate to your views on how humans are currently communicating and networking. And it relates to my next point. I, I did a, a lot of name dropping last week and people seem to love being mentioned in a synchronous session. A lot reported feeling really connected and I liked that too. I thought that was, that was a nice feeling. But it is difficult to do it meaningfully for 22,000 people. And I do know that I missed some people who were making really good points, so sorry to them. And please don't feel offended if you're not mentioned directly. But not everybody wants to be. Uh, I was intrigued this week by a blogger who said she definitely doesn't want to... Uh, let's see, I'm just going to bring her, her, um, a screenshot up from her blog. Can, is that showing? Yeah. Yep. Yes, it is. It be. Um, that uh, this, this is somebody who, whose name I can't mention because we don't know what it is, apart from e-goggles. Um, and she's a wife and a mum and a teacher, but otherwise she's anonymous. And she wants to be private. And indeed, she claims it's a human need. And she won't use Flickr, she says, because some things are just private to humans. So this is something that's picked up by other people. Um, when they're, they're thinking about the dehumanization of some of the communications. And I think she's seeing 
flicker um, as part of this process. So, no thanks, Mr. Yahoo, you're asking for too much, she says. Um, and she calls this teacher, underlined teacher. Um, so, this is someone who's very clear about her boundaries, but, but she has produced a thought provoking image. Uh, and at first sight, it sort of neatly divides, illustrates a divide between the human and robotic approaches to teaching, which would fit with some of the warnings and some of the readings that we've, we've had for this week, suggesting perhaps we'd, we give up our humanity if we allow the robots to take over. And yet, the image is a bit more subtle than just that division. I keep returning to it and thinking, is it either the robot or the teacher supplanting the other, uh, or is the potential uh, for, for both? Is there room for both? Do we add the human touch, as we, uh, an expression we've used this week, to the robot teacher, or are we encouraging teachers to actualize their human potential through automating some of their educational practices? And what does that mean? And does a drawing of a teacher represent something more real than a drawing of a robot? And what are the little childlike drawing? I, I don't know if you can see it on the, on the chalkboard, um, the, the stick drawing. Um, what's, what's that saying? What kind of, and what kind of shadow does this compound being cast? I hadn't even noticed that, but thanks to Ashem for pointing out the shadow to me. Mm -hmm. And look at how the human being is actually coming out of the frame. What's the message there? When we think of our images, then, of, of what is human, um, do they vary according to the humanity we attribute to them? Because we're seeing, um, we're, we're, we're seeing a human being there and a robot. But it is a drawing. And is a stick drawing at one level, a cartoon at another level, and perhaps a photo is getting more human, and then a video indicates human presence, and if it's synchronous in a hangout like here, does that make it more real, or when does the, the humanity start to kick in? And these different levels of humanity and images have echoes of the different levels of humanity that Steve Fuller talks of in his presentation. These were just thoughts triggered by, by this intriguing um, image that isn't an en entry to the Flickr competition. It's anonymous. Um, it's had quite a strong impact. And like a, a few people have been saying in the forums, people are engaging with our course in a range of different ways. They don't necessarily want to win a bauble or, or even to get the certificate at the I end. I can't understand that. <laughs> but, <laughs> it is very puzzling. <laughs> But, and anonymity has been a fascinating topic in the forums too. I think I've been talking for long enough, so I'll have to save that for another day. But uh, I've, I've really enjoyed looking at this image and, and thinking about what it's saying uh, to, from an anonymous poster. Yeah, I really enjoyed that analysis, Christine. It's a really interesting example. Um, yeah, Bernard... Um, Bernard has just um, put a question up, it's, well not a question, it's a point really, he says some, some EDC MOOC students um, want their names to be mentioned publicly, others want to remain private, there's diversity in the way we think, which I think is a really interesting um, kind of reminder really of the, the fact that it's important not to sort of homogenize kind of our understanding of what people want within a MOOC, um, but make, it's a bit of a hard call for the teacher as well, isn't it? How do we know if someone wants to be mentioned by name or not? So, um, Yes, yeah. this is true. Is it, is it a, bit of, um, a, bit, a bit impertinent to mention people by name or draw attention to, um, to them when they're trying very hard to be anonymous? I hope I haven't caused any offence. However, she does say she wants feedback. She won't use Flickr. It's not because I don't want feedback, but she doesn't want to use Flickr. Yeah. There's another interesting point that um, Kenneth Bernard has raised about synchronicity. He, sa he says that only that he says that online education needs both synchronous and asynchronous communication, uh, yeah. which I think is interesting because I've always been quite intrigued by the way that time operates differently in online education than it does in on-campus, you know, conventional education, where 
we tend to have very much a focus on the synchronous, you know, tutorial lecture. Um, there's something quite, quite exciting about that kind of idea of temporal play, isn't there, within online education? Yeah. I loved asynchronous when I was a student on our course. I loved the the fact that I could change my mind about what I was going to say in mm. class. Yes. <laughs> 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 the ability to think before you can speak is pretty yeah. good. Um, but for, I mean, folks know I think uh, that my preference is very much for the asynchronous, for lots of the reasons that Christine mentioned earlier, that you can uh, augment what you say, and hopefully you can you can get things right. Uh, and I was conscious of uh, mentioning one name last time around. Um, um, I misattributed this, uh, this colleague's nationality, but someone asked me to clarify, and I was able to go away and look it up and get it right. And uh, so, you know, that's part of the dialogue that we've got here. Mm -hmm. that, that we can be questioned and called, and we learn because we are sent away to, to do some uh, further research. So, for me, that doesn't have to be synchronous. And in many ways, I, I much prefer it if it isn't synchronous because one has time to reflect. Yeah, interesting. There's some. There's a, a little bit of discussion going on um, on on Twitter. Um, Dominic says we should be thinking about using technology to take the drudge work out of teaching, so you can focus on higher order skills and more quality time with students. So. I guess that's a reference to the, the idea that we could delegate the drudge work to the robot or to the automated um, teacher function um, and, and keep our own time for, for different stuff. That's really in interesting, although Andy Mitchell then comes in and says, I sometimes wonder if we haven't already reached robot stage when I watch people <laughs> working in the service industry. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a kind of salient point. Oh, Andy also says that I can mention his name as much as I want, so I will. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andy has a thing about names, it seems to me. Uh, <laughs> experience. Uh, You'll have to explain that now, Hamish. Will yeah. I? Uh, well, it's, uh, yes, all right. Um, uh, one of my favourite uh, artefacts from last time around um, was a Twitter account which appeared um, in my name uh, and then proceeded to tweet about internet security. Hmm. So you know, that self-referential, playful thing. You know, once you've worked out what's going on here, here's my name, here's my image, and it's a Twitter account that I'm not controlling. Uh, but the point about internet security was, was really very strongly made by by that uh, exercise. And very carefully uh, made. Uh, and very courteously made, I should say. And courteously. Say. Yeah. Don't, don't try this at home unless you... Uh, yeah, you absolutely. Do. But um, uh, I have a... Very dangerous. Uh, I, I have a very soft spot for the perpetrator of that particular... <laughs> uh, very well artifact. done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, it was... Yeah, it's clever to play so kind of um, critically with notions of identity and privacy and personal, you know, and personality, but not to offend anybody was quite impressive. Um, I've noticed so that somebody's just told me I'm a computer. <laughs> <laughs> I like that too. Uh, Matthew, I think, Math Pluard, uh, you're, you're a, a computer program, Christine Sinclair. I'm not even a computer, I'm a computer program. Well, he says he's not going to, he says he's not going to believe you're real unless he sees you in meat space. So that, <laughs> that's it. So come to, come to network learning and, um, and network learning. learning yeah. we'll, all be, we'll all be there. <laughs> I've got a good question for everybody from um, Sean, Sean McLean that's come through in YouTube and he says, just as students are struggling with new levels of anonymity and publicity, what about instructors? Mm. On, on the one hand, MOOCs increase the audience, um, making them the superstars of education. Instead of 20 or 100 people listening to your ideas, now there are tens of thousands. That can be exciting and daunting. What are your thoughts on this? Mm. Does anyone have any thoughts apart from <laughs> terror? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, Shan, Shan and I have been working on um, a report and which has been outlining the, um, the sort of MOOC landscape in the UK and one of the things that's coming through um, quite strongly in the conversations that we've been having with other MOOC teachers um, who are teaching these big, big open courses is that 
um, the the sense of of feeling exposed and being um, on display and being public in a way that people often haven't experienced before is actually quite a significant part of what it means to be a MOOC teacher. Um, and I, I think uh, I would certainly agree with that. It it is surprisingly um, what's the word? <laughs> it's surprising. Uh, the feel, the feeling of being, of being a sub, a more, a more public figure than certainly I've ever, I've ever had reason to experience before. Can yeah. I, can I observe how disturbing I find that? I mean, I am desperately trying to pretend that this isn't what's happening here, mm. <laughs> um, and, it, well, sorry, I, perhaps I should just leave it at that, but um, uh, I, I, I certainly don't relish it in any way. Um, and, you know, I, I think what I do relish and what I do enjoy actually is the uh, casual serendipitous encounters with some of these people. It, it's, it's those encounters and they're random encounters and there are um, one at one level, wishes that that um, one could have those engagements with with a larger number of people on the MOOC. Uh, it's just logically impossible. But it, it's that which I find uh, really exciting. Not the fact that I'm talking to lots of people, but that I have the opportunity to talk directly to one or two people. Mm. Uh, and that, for me, seems to be uh, you know a powerful feature of what we're doing here. Yeah, agreed. I don't think there are many academics who signed up to the notion of being a kind of a media star when they just when they took their first academic job. Do you know what I mean? Although maybe mm. more are now that are coming in. Um, it's a, a question of how the academic kind of job profile is shifting. I guess. Um, interesting. Um, Okay, there's a nice comment from Ian Minderman come through on Twitter. He says, this course is as good as the education courses I took in university. The Hangouts are a main reason why excellent readings and peer discussions. So thanks for that, Ian. Um, I think Matt, now might be a, a good time to hand over to Jeremy because Jeremy's going to talk a little bit about what's been um, jumping out for him on EDC MOOC this week. Um, Jeremy, thanks. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, just to reiterate... Um, in the introduction um, that the images coming into the Flickr River stream have been fantastic and I would encourage people to continue submitting images if, if they like. They've really intrigued me this week and helped me think about um, some of the things that are being discussed in the forum as well. I could have really talked about any of those images but I chose two specific images to talk about really because I, they helped me to think about what this course is doing and specifically I think um, what the themes uh, of week three being human um, kind of mean to me. So the, the first one that really uh, stood out for me, which I'm going to share with you now, hopefully, is um, this image called School of Future um, by Ian. I'm going to use Ian because that is his, his name publicly in um, Flickr. Um, so what was really interesting for me was this this is a remix of uh, School of Athens so this is a very well-known fresco by Raphael um, this is uh, what we're seeing is, is really a small section of a much larger image and it's an image that really embodies um, the ideals of the of the European Renaissance so that what I mean by that is re a European re-engaging medieval European re-engaging with texts of the classical world glorifying um, Greek scientists and Greek philosophers um, and, and many of those well-known um, Greek figures populate the rest of the scene in, in, in the wider image we're only looking at the center section here so what seemed to be important there was that this veneration of the classical world is something that I, I think still lingers today still lingers in education still lingers in philosophy and the arts um, this idea that the Greeks represented a supposed um, height of, of European culture. Um, so it's it's the Renaissance and it's precisely images like this which did that, which instilled Greek culture as this this pinnacle of um, art and philosophy. Yet for me the the original, the, 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 the image which this uh, represents, School of Athens, is I think like the Renaissance itself a remix. It's a kind of Catholic remix of pre-Christian Greek culture. 
um, as well as uh, Roman. I mean, if you if we look at uh, the background, which we can just see here, the, the architecture is Roman rather than Greek. So for me, the, there's a, there's a remix aspect to the to the original Renaissance, which this image is is representing. So of course, what what is mainly interesting about the Renaissance for me here is um, is humanism, and of course that relates to um, this week's theme of of being human. Despite um, this, the the original school of Athens depicting Greeks, um, the Renaissance is very much part of in within a Christian context. So this particular fresco is located in the Vatican. It's, in, it's something that's endorsed by the Catholic Church. So that's a very different kind of humanism to, for example, the Enlightenment, which is the other European movement that's often associated with humanism, um, which the Enlightenment is, I guess, considered a lot more secular. It's really a, can be interpreted as, as a replacing of the authority of a high being with the authority of the, of the rational mind of the human being. So for me, this idea, this, the way that this image referenced the Renaissance really resonated um, with some of the things that Steve Fuller was talking about in his lecture this week, about the shifting categories of humanity, um, how they are historically contingent, how they're mutable, they're changing over time, uh, depending on, on the situation in which human beings are in. Um, so the Renaissance and the, the original image that this, this is referencing depicts a particular kind of um, being human. I think Ian's remix is really clever and, and uh, I guess here's why. Uh, the, in the original image, um, the two central figures w which are the focus of, of this, um, of the, the part of the image that um, is being referenced here, the two central figures are Plato and Aristotle. So on the left we have Plato who is uh, allegedly pointing upwards to signify that his philosophy is about um, a kind of higher inaccessible truth against which uh, the world around us are, are, is, is merely a shadow. And we've already had people um, referencing Plato's cave um, in previous weeks, which was really in interesting. And Christine mentioned that last time around, I think. And in contrast to Plato, we have Aristotle on, on the right, whose hand is lowered, um, supposedly signifying his philosophy, which is about the actual, the tangible, the worldly, the empirical. So we might say that what is symbolized in the original image is uh, the two ways that Western thinking is um, kind of based on. Philosophy on the left-hand side with Plato and science, empiricism on the right-hand side with Aristotle. That may be a little bit of a simplistic reading there, but um, what I think is really interesting about um, Ian's remix is how it, cha it changes that reading. It signifies maybe a different kind of divide, different but also a really powerful divide in the way that we think about technology and that's something I think we've we've seen um, and I've certainly seen particularly um, in this week. So if we look at what Ian's done, Plato on the left um, is adorned with wonderful gadgets and of course if you look at what he's viewing on his iPad you can see he has very good MOOCs, he's really picking good ones. <laughs> um, so what I think is we might read that as uh, as uh, Plato representing how the digital is perceived as virtual, as otherworldly, as unreal, as kind of non-human. And he has access to this transcendent domain, which he's pointing upwards towards through his gadgetry. While Aristotle, the more worldly of the two figures, um, is in, in, the, in, the, in an opposing position. So he's viewing the online as illusory, as inauthentic as unnatural com um, compared with his worldly face-to-face uh, -face form of education. And of course this is, is within the, the wider image which is the, the Athens school. So for me this, this remix points to um, an interesting divide between, a divide in the way we, per we, we perceive technology between the online and the offline, between the digital and the real. And it's this divide which seemed to me to be very prominent in uh, the forum discussions this week and that was interesting for me because this week for me was about proposing that question of well, what it is to be human and, and when this question is asked it seems that this real virtual divide becomes quite pronounced in the way people are approach the answering of that question what what is the human the human condition and it seems in deciding what being human is quite quickly a boundary is drawn between an authentic nature 
and an inauthentic te technology. That's one of the first boundaries that appears to be drawn. So being human is thought of in a kind of pure, in terms of a, a kind of purification, a deciding of, of what being human is by rejecting um, an outside, deciding what is exclusively human. So the discussion thread I've been um, participating in and enjoying this week um, is entitled the, the Human Touch. I won't share it here because it's it's within the, the Corsair platform, but you can search for it by typing the Human Touch, and many of you, I'm sure, would have seen that already. So it's been really interesting to see in there what, what I think is quite um, quite a strong rejection of the use of technology in education. Um, just take away that image so you can see me. A quite strong uh, reject, rejection of the use of digital technology. And this seems to be on the grounds that technology is otherworldly. That true human um, communication uh, is, is kind of threatened by technology creating this unnatural domain in which people, people go into, people participate in. And that tangible, physical co-presence with other human beings seems to be being put forward as, as the vital, the essential part of our being human. So the way that being human is seems to be formulated in this thread seems to be this kind of decontamination, a cleansing of our relationships and interactions with other things, with technology, and that boundary being drawn to separate what is purely human from, from what is an outside. Essentially, deciding on what being human is by searching for an essence, a, a thing that's purely human. So I want to return to that point as a, as a way of thinking about... Um, about what it is to be human, but I want to share the second image that I really enjoyed this week to, to continue that point. Um, this is called uh, Technology Versus Plants by Maria. So despite the verses in this title, for me I thought this was a, a really good place to start to think about juxtaposition. And juxtaposition is something that for me started to help me to think about questioning and challenging what I was perceiving as dualisms in, in terms of nature, culture, and, and human technology, both in the images and in, and in the forums. So if we look at this idea of juxtaposition, um, technology and nature are swapped. So in this image, we could read it as the USB cable is depicted as growing, as organic, as biological. But at the same time, that implies that the plants are, are machinic. They're their own kind of um, technology. They're, they're transferring their own different kind of information. So that's, for me, what the, the, this idea of juxtaposition is doing. It's challenging the dualism that those two things are it's separate. So for me, this is a way of thinking um, that gets to the heart of, of what this course is about, my, my interpretation of what this course is about. So if we look back at weeks one and two, um, we can view the tendencies to gravitate towards extremities, the utopic and the dystopic, we, we choose either one because both of those options preserve the nature, culture, human technology binary. And they do that because the human is preserved in, in both of those choices. People don't, it seems to me, people don't mind a dystopic story. They don't mind that kind of narrative because even if technology takes over the world, we are preserved as human beings within within that narrative, the uh, kind of uncontaminated by by an external world, and that seems to me what we see in lots of the the sci-fi stories that people have been referencing. You know, the, the the robots can take over the world, but in doing so, that distills and intensifies our humanness. It's a, humanness becomes a reaction to something, um, to something new, and that re that reaction is to purify and look inwards for our humanity. So for me, um, the juxtaposition that, um, that the, the uh, technology versus plants image seems to point to might be a useful way to approach um, the week three idea of being human in a, in a different and in a non-dualistic way. So instead of in attempting to define ourselves in terms of an essence, to look for what is purely and exclusively a human state, Another uh, another way to kind of define us, define being human, could be in terms of relations to other things, um, could be in terms of connections, 
could be um, thinking about being human as being hybrid. And for me, that's one way that we could, a useful way that we could um, then approach some of the topics we might um, talk about in week four. So that, uh, yeah, I think that's about it for interesting things for me. <laughs> oh, that was interesting. Thanks, Jeremy. That was that was great. And there are a couple of um, there are a couple of quite quite good uh, questions coming through that relate to what you've been talking about. Um, this one is is um, an app at Hamish McLeod, but it actually relates to to what you've been saying too. It's from Vincent. And he says, um, coming through on Twitter, he says, do you believe that a human could reclassify their reality and accept the company of a hypothetical subspecies like a cyborg? So, um, Hamish, what do you think? Because <laughs> that one's directed at you. Give Jeremy a chance to have a little drink. Yeah, well, um, yeah. Um, can I... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Can I recommend a book? Um, <laughs> How do I do this now? I'll jump to the camera. It's called The Intimate Machine uh, by uh, a psychologist called Neil Prude. And it was published in uh, about 1984, I think. And in it, he talks about the way in which we react to technology. So actually, I think the straight answer to that question would be, I think it, we would find it very, very easy. Uh, because when we react to technologies, we are reacting on the basis of our psychology, not on the basis of what's in their psychology, if you like. Uh, I, I think this is something that um, Sherry Turkle talks about as well. She talks about the, 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 uh, the technology as being a machine, but with a psychology. So we've got something which is so complicated that um, we can only think about it, we'd only talk about it in psychological language. So we talk about machines having intentions, we talk about memory, we talk about, um, uh, well, sorry, I'm losing the place. Uh, you know, we, we use metaphors of human psychology to characterize the capacities and the, and, and, and the, the, the uh, activities and behaviors of our technologies. So we are doing it, we are attributing to the technology. Uh, Again, I won't be able to find the book, but um, uh, I think I mentioned last time um, Computer Power and Human Reason by Joseph Weizenbaum. Again, many of you may have come across this. The, um, this is where he talks about the, uh, the program that he built called ELISA. And ELISA was a very simple uh, language processing uh, program which would behave like a Rogerian psychotherapist. That is, it would, it would, you would type something to it, and it would come back reflecting back to you what you just said. So, if you said, um, uh, "I have a terrible relationship with my father," the program would come back and say, "Tell me more about your family." And that was a very, very simple piece of software. But the thing is that people treated it as if it was, you know, in some senses, understanding them. Um, and th th there are some fantastic examples of how that program behaved. Um, I, I think there's an example in uh, a book called Margaret, a book by Margaret Borden. Um, I cannot remember what it is. Uh, I could, somebody can transcribe this, and I can annotate it with uh, <laughs> reference. Uh, but the seduction of technology isn't coming so much from the technology as coming from our own intersubjective tendencies and desires. So if you think about when we see faces on cliffs, you know, every tourist spot you're taken and you're pointed to the face on the cliff, um, we see natural organisms, we see human faces, human uh, characteristics in diffuse random uh, patterns because we want to or we're inclined to see this into subjectivity so yeah I, I, I would find it <laughs> I would find it very easy uh, but I think we naturally would find it very easy to see this intersubjective engagement coming from from our technologies I have two questions about that oh sorry Jan no go Jen 
Um, first of all, it, it seems like it works the other way around as well, right? Like, not only do we attribute we our metaphors for our machines are sort of they have memory and they have other things that are kind of human, but also we we start to define our own um, processes yes. in humanity in terms of the, the in terms of the machine processes. So we talk about you know. Um, D downtime and thing, you know, things that yes. are kind of Bandwidth. coming from, uh -huh, mm. um, and processing and those kinds of things that are sort of machine metaphors to describe human human activities. Well, you're looking for another book, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, uh, I can't remember what my other question was now. But we've always done that, haven't we? We did it with clockwork, I think, didn't we? We we started to see the human mind as a, a kind of clockwork and. Uh, with the Industrial Revolution, we we saw ourselves as um, as, as machinery uh, of, of reproducing things. I think I I think that's because we are really very very interested to understand ourselves. Yeah. And therefore, we use current technologies as metaphors. So, uh, uh, the, whatever is the prominent technology of any given time, it, it has been used as a metaphor to understand yeah. how, how the mind works and what the mind does. I think there's an interesting link actually as well in Vincent's question about whether we can accept into our company a, a hypothetical subspecies like a cyborg. I think there's quite a nice link there to a, an area of posthumanist thinking that we haven't really had time to cover in EDC MOOC but which is the link to animal studies and the notion that we mm. accept into our company um, other species all the time, it's completely normal in our lives um, and how do we how do we think about those interspecies relationships and their effect on um, the notion of what it means to be human, do the animals in our lives help us understand what it means to be human by not being human um, or is there something mm. more complex and going on, um, I think that's a really interesting set of questions. And we do have a bird participating in the EDC MOOC. So. Hi Mia. It's very exactly. much <laughs> I know, what's the function of Mia with an EDC MOOC, you know? <laughs> Is she only reflecting our own humanity back to us? I think she might be. Um, there's another question come through from Bernard on, about on the same issue really. He's asking, do we remain pure human when we're exposed to technology or do we become a hybrid between the human and the technological? Um, so that's, that's interesting. Um, I don't know if anyone has a view on that. I noticed that. Oh, sorry, uh, I noticed a lot of people were talking about coexistence as a theme. It's not either or, and uh, is that behind that question? But we... coexistence seems to suggest there are two different sorts of things existing and rather I, than merging. I yeah, yeah. I, I think that some of the language yeah. around this is interesting as well. It's kind yeah. of revealing of um, of how close we're prepared to come to that technology before we say actually there's a difference between it and me, and I know what that difference is. Mm. Um, so, Hamish, somebody is asking, uh, are you in a library? <laughs> no. <laughs> I have a serious uh, problem habit. Uh, <laughs> um, in fact, you know, if people were around in the first Hangout in week one, you know how um, Hamish had a knock on his door towards the end of the um, session. It was somebody delivering an Amazon parcel. Um, it, was, it wasn't a boot cover. It was, oh, come, oh no, that's right. It was a USB cable or something. I think yes. Um, Whitney's enjoying enjoying the books. She says pictures of real books from um, Dr. McLeod. Thanks for that. Hope nothing replaces the luxury of turning paper pages. <laughs> EDC, EDC, EDC books getting all nostalgic. <laughs> <laughs> I've been around for a long time. Uh, I'm now acquiring Kindle editions of books I already have. Mm -hmm. um, um, Sorry, but I, oh, sorry, Hamish. Well, just a very quick one. Um, uh, our use of fire. Okay, so that's a technology. Uh, and again, I can't remember the author's name, but there's a book called Catching Fire, and it's about how the use of fire has changed us, and it's changed us physically in all sorts of interesting ways. So, cooking. Uh, we our our gut has changed as a function of, of cooking. Our gut has changed, um, and the, 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 obviously there are, there are interesting uh, cross-cultural national differences in uh, whether or not we can usefully use and digest milk and milk products. So there's this co-evolution going on 
with our low level technologies which we you know perhaps don't tend to think about we think about the uh, the high end information technologies because things change so rapidly but actually over the course of human evolution uh, our technologies in various ways have absolutely changed us uh, and we have co-evolved with some of these cultural artifacts that, that we've used yeah interesting one there's a can I feed in another question that's come through from Sylvia on um, YouTube um, it refers back to Jeremy what Jeremy was saying about the um, the first image um, she says now Plato idealistically is holding the future the technology and Aristotle's holding the book the present meaning maybe that technology is viewed not so much as unnatural but as more unreachable than traditional ways of knowledge which I think relates back to this sort of book nostalgia that um, we're commenting on just now. What do you think, Jeremy? <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's a nice reading. Um, I, I did notice the book, um, and I was, I was going to comment on that a little bit, but it's, it's, it's nice that it, there's that distinction uh, made there with the, the book as, um, if, if we take the idea that Aristotle was more worldly and he was more interested in the tangible, then the, the book is certainly that. The book is something that you can physically get hold of, and I think that was mentioned in in one of the tweets earlier. You know this this joy of um, the physical connection with the book in terms of turning the pages, whereas uh, on the, on the left, Plato has these kind of ethereal things like Google Glass, which give him knowledge that isn't isn't tangible, isn't touchable, and and maybe that's a, a mm. different futuristic take on. On knowledge there. Yeah, interesting reading. Yeah. I, I love the idea of Plato glimpsing the forms through the iPad, you know, seeing the, the forms <laughs> of actual things, so he can probably see beauty and and um, love and things in their, in their true forms through the iPad. I don't think he would have agreed, but <laughs> I like the idea. I'm thinking <laughs> augmented cognition here, uh, layers. Um, you could have uh, all sorts of philosophical constructs overlaid on the world around about you. Uh, sorry, run with that, somebody, if you will. Um, well, Mia, Mia has tweeted us. <laughs> she said, EDC MOOC, greetings. Those who are animal guardians understand your question about learning many things from other species, including cyborgs, no doubt, but she doesn't actually say that. Um, <laughs> so Ian, Ian Mindeman has posted an interesting question about agency and relationships with technology. He says, is, is the influence of um, tech on us passive or active? Does tech require us to engage it to have an impact, or does it have an impact on us just by existing? Interesting. Ooh, that reminds me of something, um, which is the idea of um, the sort of individual. I think it might be um, Deleuze's idea of this, these sort of um, kind of technological versions of ourselves that go trotting around cyberspace, whether we know about them or not, every time we're sort of database every time we're in a database there's a sort of a little copy of ourselves of some aspect of ourselves there um, online and really to some extent it doesn't really matter if we engage with the technology or not because the technology is engaged with us in the sense that it's holding important data about us it's holding um, things that make a difference to our material lives in, not, in a lot of cases um, so I would say it maybe it, it doesn't matter um, all that much actually whether we willingly or consciously engage with the technology or, or not. Yeah I think uh, just to, to follow up from there, yeah I think that the assumption in that question is that um, you, are all, you are already separate from the technology so that there's an embedded assumption in that question and I think if we, we go back a, a couple of seconds to um, what Christine was saying about um, Plato kind of accessing these pure forms you know that kind of reminded me that what we're seeing there in the original School of Athens with Plato and Aristotle is this for me this the, you know the core of Western thinking of, of getting to essence getting to truth you either do it the, through Plato as the inaccessible truth of philosophy or you do it empirically with Aristotle um, where am I going with this? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, you might ask. <laughs> that, that seems to be in the way that we decide 
what I was trying to talk about earlier was that seems to be embedded in the way we decide what being human is, is that we look for purity, we look for essence. And maybe that isn't, maybe that isn't, that's so ingrained in the way we think when we define something. We, th we tend to think about it, try to access um, a pure essence of that thing, either empirically or philosophically. And maybe, but maybe that isn't the only way to think about um, things. And um, so if we're thinking about things like agency, the, the first step isn't to think, well, there's a, there's a subject and an object and which one has agency, but to, to begin before that assumption. Yeah, that's an interesting one. And I think a comment from Vincent, another comment from Vincent on YouTube, on I'm um, sorry, on Twitter, actually connects quite interestingly to that because he's asking about um, brain backup. You know, which is he says we're reading about the possibility to make a backup of our brain. Is this an open door to immortality? So I guess he's touching on the kind of transhumanist fantasy of brain download and the extent to which that challenges the notion of purity of the human. Um, does human purity have to reside in a kind of in um, a fleshy body, or or can the human be up be uploaded or um, or backed up to a different medium? I don't know what people think about that. I guess it connects to the notion of embodiment and what that means for um, the way in which we understand knowledge and what it means to be a human being. The idea of immortality challenges that quite a lot because if you if you can be immortal then it changes perhaps your whole um, moral outlook, your ethical way of being. There's no, uh, if there's no end to things then mm. what happens? I, I was reading, reading somewhere recently, I think maybe The Guardian, about the, the Doctor Who and I know we need to get Doctor Who in somewhere. Right. <laughs> but doc Doctor Who, because he's immortal, oh. has has battles <laughs> with his or with with his alter egos and his his companions. And I haven't watched Doctor Who since the first series. <laughs> but uh, he is not, of course, immortal. He is simply very, very old. Uh. <laughs> ah, I thought he was immortal. Ah. I was just having another thought, Christine. Um, I had this image um, of an error message. Um, Heaven has encountered a problem and will have to shut down. Um, so let's hope that the backup isn't... Uh, no, sorry, I can't mention uh, already uh, too many product placements here. Uh, but uh, yes, how secure would you feel this backup would be? Um, but there's, uh, there's a... Uh, I think it's. It, I think the book is called Software uh, by Rudy Rooker, and it, it's about this notion that you could instantiate the human mind or the human brain in a computer, but you would actually have to slice up the brain first of all. Uh, so the, the 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 premise is that you can have immortality but the system that delivers immortality will have to destroy your physical body in order mm -hmm. to do that. It's going to have to read your brain and that's going to be a destructive process. Uh, and and so that's what they play around with. So it's a, it's a very interesting notion. Could I Could I maybe ask a question of EDC MOOC and the people that are watching this and, and are on Twitter or elsewhere? Um, it's, a, it's a question actually that Steve Fuller posed in a, a talk he was giving in Edinburgh once and um, he asked if you basically if you could choose immortality via brain download would you choose it um, maybe if people were able to kind of um, present their position on that in Twitter then we can feed back mm. at the end whether EDC MOOC participants would choose immortality if it was offered to them um, and then, uh, then I'll tell you what Steve Fuller actually um, said about that on the basis of um, his own asking of that question in various form, um, forums around and about the place. Mm -hmm. um, but while that's happening, I've got a couple of questions which are to do with um, the process of the uh, of the hangout, which are quite interesting. The first one is from Ian. He says, "Why does Doctor Knox have a ladder in his office? Are you catching light bulbs?" <laughs> <laughs> I think Jeremy's just about to ascend to 
the stars or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Why have you got a ladder in your office, Jeremy? Um, I need. To, I'm climbing up to the heights of humanism <laughs> one day. <laughs> um, okay. The next question is. Uh, it's this link to the last one. It's from Wendy um, on YouTube. She's she's saying, do you instructors have a feeling of being watched by thousands or just by those who post comments? And how how is it different from a lecture hall of three hundred? Uh, I can say quickly that what what I often think about is people watching in the future. I, I sometimes possibly wrongly think that not that many people are watching live, but many people will be watching in the future. So for me that's very different to times that I've spoken um, synchronously with people in a room because I, I have this thought that it's being recorded and the, the audience it will, is, has a, a different duration. So we can maybe edit it before it goes out. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> <laughs> we could just go in and, and change the um, transcripts. Change the transcripts, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I oscillate between thinking, I'm just sitting here in my office talking to my computer, and then thinking, there are people all over the world listening. Uh, it's really strange. Um, but not the same as looking out at a sea of faces. Interestingly, when you look out at a sea of faces, when you've got 300 people in the lecture room, you automatically look for the person who's smiling and nodding. And in my case, it's it's my four colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's very easy to spot them, even in a crowd of 300, especially if there's only one of them. <laughs> I Okay. No, I was just going to say, for me, the the hangout feels much more um, much more intimate than yeah. lecturing to a large room of people. It's it feels less scary, although I think that's probably a delusion um, <laughs> because usually when you lecture to a large um, lecture theatre or whatever, it's not going to it's not being broadcast um, live and will probably not be archived um, uh, to, for posterity on the internet, so if, yes, it feels more intimate, but maybe it isn't really. I, I, I don't know, what, Jen, what you were going to come in with. Uh, well, I was going to say it feels kind of intimate, but um, in a kind of I feel like I feel like the people who are talking with us on Twitter and other and the other places are kind of here in this you know in this kind of hangout space, um, it, and in that sense, it feels really. Um, I don't know. It's interesting. It's not like any other. Actually, not like any other experience yeah. that I've I've had before. Um, I, I'm aware that there are people that we we'll, won't we won't see and won't interact with, who are sort of here as well. But um, somehow, I don't know. I don't know. Actually, that's not very articulate. But it is very. It is quite quite interesting. Quite different. I think the idea of audience is really interesting and how how extensive that is. I've just heard somebody close a door, um, in the next room, so they can probably hear me. Speaking, so there's a different kind of audience, and of course, people who are logged in mm. as participants may have people looking over their shoulder, um, as people who are not necessarily involved in the MOOC but viewing the Hangout. So, I think mm. the idea of audience is really different when when you have this kind of broadcast. Mm. Okay. And one of the things that can sometimes happen is uh, people will recognise you later because of this. Um, so today, two of our distance students from that are arriving next semester actually turned up at a postgraduate open day um, and I, I was told that they that one of them was here so I, I went to find them uh, but they Im immediately recognized me because they've seen me in from the hangouts because they've they've both done the MOOC um, which is very very useful I suppose but you <laughs> I don't recognise them, of course. <laughs> okay, well, I think we're coming. It's, it's actually six o'clock. Um, oh, wow. the, the hour has gone very quickly. Um, so I want to um, to thank everybody. But before doing that, I just want to say what's coming through on the immortality question is kind of there's <laughs> one. Um, um, where are we? Tina, no, not Tina. Philip, Philip Bryan has said that he would, yes, definitely. He already has an avatar and would happily upload the me into it. Mm. Um, whereas Matthew Plurd has come through and said said basically the opposite. That no, he would not choose immortality. It would take away life as a journey. Um, 
So I think, and, and Jeremy and Jen and Christine, I think too, were at the talk with Steve Fuller. I think what Steve Fuller said when he asked this question is that almost no one would choose immortality. Um, so, so Philip, um, you might be on your own. No, no, Mia's, <laughs> Mia's gone for it as well. Mia's upset oh, at the thought. Oh. Of Mia's a little bit outraged, actually. Yeah. I, I, I'm guessing from all those exclamation points. Yeah. <laughs> Mia, Mia didn't realise she was going to die. Oh, gosh, sorry, Mia. We've, we've ruined everything for you. Mm -hmm. um, but, okay, mm. so on, on, on that, I think it's probably a nice, a, a good point to end. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what, we're all going to die. That's right. Yeah, oh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> Let's face it and go and enjoy our Friday night. Huh? <laughs> um, so thank you so much, everybody, who's taken part. Thanks for all the, the questions coming through and the, the comments. Um, have been really fantastic tonight and Fiona and Kevin and Stephen have done a wonderful job of um, feeding those into it. It's felt genuinely um, like it's been a dialogic event mm -hmm. um, and, and, and thanks to, um, to everybody for being here and have wonderful weekends and our next hangout is next week on Friday um, but it's at a different time. It's at 10 a.m. Um, UK time. Uh, we have our graduation that afternoon so um, so we'll we'll be at that in the afternoon. So I hope that your people will be able to come back um, and join us again next Friday morning, um, if that works for you in whatever time zone you're in. So thanks everybody, and I think we'll shut down the hangout. Uh, have good weekends. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.